All right, if you take your Bibles now and turn to Matthew chapter 5, we will continue to look at this great sermon preached by the greatest preacher. More specifically, let's see what God, through this text, says to his people this morning. So once you arrive there, let's go before the Lord again. Ask ask his help to open up our eyes to see wondrous things from his law. Let's pray. Lord God, as we look now again to this perfect sermon, this perfect proclamation of what it means to be a citizen of the kingdom, Lord, from your very own Son, the greatest preacher of all, Lord, I pray that these words, these 2,000-year-old words, would ring in every soul here today as we see these realities, these verses that many have known and perhaps even cherished. Lord, I pray that we would see them with fresh eyes, eyes that see the richness of them, of the truths therein, and seek to apply them to our very own lives. Help us to see your glory and live in light of it. And so we pray in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, again, we return to Matthew chapters 5 through 7, which record the Sermon on the Mount. Just as a reminder, which we introduced last time, we saw Jesus' public ministry begins in Matthew 4, and he's calling disciples to himself, as we saw in that same chapter. In this sermon, it comes right through that. Same reality. He's not speaking to the crowds in general. He has a purpose here, as we introduced last time. It's to instruct his disciples. So this is not primarily an evangelistic sermon, though as we'll see in chapter 7 at the very end, as the crowds kind of creep in to the background, the Lord starts addressing them as well. But primarily, this sermon is given to his disciples to instruct them as to what it means to be a kingdom citizen, what that looks like. And it's introduced clearly in the sermon's introduction, which we call the Beatitudes. These nine statements from verses 3 through 12, which lay out the marks of a kingdom citizen. What are the main driving characteristics of a true kingdom citizen? One, as we've seen with each of these statements, one who is blessed, right? What does that word mean? It means to live at literally the supreme level of life. This is what life is all about. This is what everyone's pursuing, even unbelievers. Every individual on planet Earth is pursuing the blessed state. And Jesus is saying, you want to be in the blessed state? It's being a citizen of my kingdom. And he points out the marks of such a kingdom citizen. And again, like we saw last time, really we can see each group of three Beatitudes as we go along. They kind of echo with similar spiritual character. As we saw in verses 3 through 5 last week, that first mark of a kingdom citizen, if you want to group them together, humility, lowliness. This week in our text, which is Matthew 5, 6 through 8, we'll see that the uh, next mark of a kingdom citizen is godliness. That is likeness to the character of God. Let's begin in verse 6, resuming the Beatitudes. Jesus says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, because they shall be satisfied. Now once again we see This is the case with all the Beatitudes, how all these marks of a kingdom citizen begin at the heart level. We saw, for example, in verse 3, blessed are the poor physically? No, the poor in spirit. And it's the same deal here. In verse 6, those who hunger and thirst, not physically, but for righteousness. Now, in terms of Jesus' contemporaries, the situation he's speaking into, hunger and thirst was a very common reality back in those days. Us today, you might say, yeah, I was hungry one time, but you don't know what hunger and thirst is like these folks did in the first century, really any of the ancient peoples. Famine was a common reality back then. It was really just a matter of time. 
and in many ways, especially just the normal working classes, that sort of thing, hunger, thirst, that could be a daily reality. You're literally working for your food. And so today, even when we hunger and thirst, I mean, some, sometimes we do it for health purposes, you know, fasting and all that. These people, they wouldn't have even thought of that. No, I need food or else I'm going to die. No, they, they realized this reality. They knew what he was talking about when it came to hunger and thirst. But even in our own day, think about that. Hungry, thirsty. It's a visceral reality, is it not? It's an all-consuming thing, is it not? When one is truly hungry and thirsty, when they're deprived of food and drink, the resources that God created us to need, when that's taken from us or we don't have it, perhaps for a short period of time. But what happens when you're really hungry and thirsty? Again, it's all-consuming. You can't think of anything else, can you? Your mind is fixed on that. Maybe you're doing something else, but it constantly comes back into your mind, and even your stomach's growling. It's making a noise at you, right? It's saying, fill me. This needs to stop. It's all-consuming. It's fixating. That's the drive of hunger and thirst, is it not? And notice what Jesus says. No, it's not just physical hunger and thirst that he's talking about. No, it's a hunger and thirst in another category. And I would dare say the hunger and thirst, the all-consuming fixation that Jesus is here describing, makes physical hunger and thirst seem like nothing. Because what he is here describing is a spiritual hunger, a spiritual thirst, which drives the soul of the disciple. But what is its object? Righteousness. What a word. What a huge, all-encompassing word. Righteousness. We saw it back in chapter 3, did we not? When Jesus came, he told John why he had to be baptized in order to fulfill all righteousness. And just like in that text, righteousness here really denotes conformance to God's total will. Thought, word, and deed. In every way, shape, and form. Conformance, a desire to obey, to line oneself up with God's total will. And we need to make that clear. Why? It's because Jesus is not describing here, uh, if, you, if you will, a saving righteousness. The kind of righteousness that Paul speaks of, for example, that's imputed to us at salvation. That kind that we indeed need. <laughs> in order to be saved. We need a foreign righteousness. We need Jesus' righteousness given to us. That's how one is saved. That's not what he's talking about here, though. Again, who is he talking to? His disciples. Those who already have that righteousness. Those who are already in right relationship with him. No, this is that conformance to God's will that they want. They want their lives, now that they have been saved, now that they are a disciple, they want their lives to line up with God's will and character. This is the desire. This is the overwhelming, all-consuming, fixating desire, urge, if you will, that overwhelms the heart of a true believer. And by the way, Jesus is not introducing some new spiritual reality here. This is all over the Bible. Turn over, if you would, to the book of Psalms, and we'll see this ourselves. Look at Psalm 42 to begin. And I want us to see this object that we are to hunger and thirst for. What is a kingdom citizen? Is this person who hungers and thirsts for this righteousness? But is it just some abstract theory righteousness? No. Look at Psalm 42, just the first two verses. Notice the imagery that David or the psalmist here uses. Like the deer panting for the water brooks. You can visualize that in your head, can't you? A deer running as fast as he can, maybe away from a predator or something else. And after that, panting for, thirsting for the water brooks. What does the psalmist say? So my soul pants for you. Oh God, 
My soul thirsts for God, indeed for the living God. Notice the object. It's God. This is the mark of any, every believer in every age. Old Testament, New Testament, doesn't matter. They want God. They have an all-consuming desire and urge to know God more and more, to be in fellowship with Him, to be in His presence. Turn over to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. I want you to see the relationship that the psalmist here brings. Because you might be saying, well, Danny, Jesus said hunger and thirst after righteousness, but you're bringing us to Psalm 42 that talks about thirsting for God. Isn't, I mean, those are different things, right? Well, look at verse 10, Psalm 119, verse 10. With all my heart, notice this is the, at the core of the, the psalmist being, I have sought you. Who? God. I have sought you, but notice the next line. Do not let me wander from your commandments. Notice the relationship there. He doesn't want to wander away from the commandments. And that is a sign, that is a signal that he is seeking after God. Look at verse 40. Psalm 119, verse 40. Again, notice the, these connections here. Behold, I long for your precepts. This is all included in righteousness, that total conformance to God's total will. And then even notice, he even says, revive me, give me life through your righteousness. Parallel there, notice, precepts, righteousness, your commandments. All these verses we've just looked at in the Psalms, they're really talking about the same thing. Because you see, to seek after righteousness, to have that abiding central to the core of your being, hunger and thirst for God's righteousness, His will to be done in you. It's really just a seeking after God, a desire for Him, a panting for Him. And this is why, as I mentioned, these three Beatitudes, they really point to godliness as the mark of a kingdom citizen. They want to be like the Lord. They want to be near Him. They want to be like Him. And this is the reality of every disciple, including us today. Hungering and thirsting for righteousness, for God, to know Him, to be near to Him. Listen to what Charles Spurgeon said, even at a deeper level. He says, it is natural for men who need bread to hunger. You don't have to tell them when to hunger or when to thirst. If they do not have bread or water, they hunger and thirst naturally, right? We've all experienced that. He goes on to say, though, So when the Spirit of God has changed our nature, that new nature, hunger and thirsts after righteousness. The old nature never did, never could, and never would do so, but the new nature hungers after righteousness. It must do so. It cannot help itself. Once again, it is natural. It's not something that the disciple, that the kingdom citizen, has to be pushed to, has to be forced upon, to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Is it perfect? Certainly not. Perfect is Jesus. We'll be glorified when we're in His presence in heaven. This side, perfect? No. But at the core of their being, it is still natural. I need Him every hour, like the hymn says. I desire Him. My soul pants like the deer after water brooks. It is natural. And that's why, especially as we're going to see later on in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus puts that right to the core of what true conversion is. You, want to be, you know what a real disciple is? You know, want to know how you can distinguish a real disciple from one who's faking it? One who's maybe putting up a show or something else? One who, Matthew 7, will say, Lord, Lord, does all kinds of things in the name of Jesus, but is not known, is not in a right relationship with Him? What does He say? A good tree produces good fruit. A bad tree produces bad fruit. This is one of the fruits naturally of the heart of a disciple, of a kingdom citizen, hungering and thirsting. I want the Lord and I want to be like the Lord. I want every atom of my life 
to conform to his will because I love him and I love his will. It's the best. It's natural. This ought to make us think, right? What is the desire of your heart? Because sadly, folks, the world, and let's face it, many professing Christians, they're hungering and thirsting for everything else. Literally anything else but God. Anything else but His righteousness. They'll put anything in the place. Anything they can. Money, success, relationships, power, all the rest. You name it. As many, in many ways, you can almost say, as many people as there are in the world, so there are as many idols, which are things that replace the God that we are to hunger and thirst for. Our world, and again, sadly, many in the professing church today are just like the Israelites in Isaiah 44, who the prophet there says, feed on ashes. Think about that imagery in terms of hungering and thirsting. They're panting. They have that desire, that urge. They know that they're not in the blessed state. They, need, they know they don't have joy. They don't have peace. They don't have comfort. They don't have hope. You name it. And so they're going after everything. And they think ashes. That's what everything in the world is. Ashes. That's what they're feeding on. That's what the world is. Jeremiah 2 Forsaking the fountain of living waters and going after what? Broken cisterns, which can't hold any water. Pushing away, rebelling against the fountain of living waters and going for dirty, broken holes full of muddy, disgusting, dirty water. That's what the world does. And that's sadly what many professing Christians who perhaps will say, Lord, Lord, and do all the things, but when it comes down to it at a soul level, between them and the Lord, perhaps no one else knows, this hunger and thirst, they have to admit honestly before, is not, before the Lord is not there. And indeed, it is tragic, it is wicked. Because yet the, the root reason of why that is such a foolish thing is because God has created every human heart in such a way that only His divine fullness can fill it. It's the old quote from Augustine, right? Our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. All the world is just a bunch of ashes. All the things of the world, all the desires of the world are just ashes compared to the, the living water compared to the bread from heaven, compared to what, what does Jesus say in our beatitude in verse 6? Why are they blessed, those that hunger and thirst, that are fixated, that are all consumed upon righteousness? Why? Because they, in fact it's emphatic in the Greek, they themselves will be satisfied. They themselves will be filled. No others. Once again, the world and all that is in the world, it's lying. It's not going to fill. Never, never can and never will. No, those who hunger and thirst for God and His righteousness, they will be filled. Listen to the words of Puritan Thomas Watson. He said, a man may hunger after the world, but he will never be filled. The world is fading, not filling. He says, cast three worlds into the heart. And yet the heart will never be full. But God and His righteousness, they fill. End quote. He's just taking that from the Bible, by the way. Isaiah 55, for example. The Lord proclaims to His people Israel, who knew better. They had all their Bibles. <laughs> he proclaims to them in their sin, when they were going after all the idols of the world, he says, listen, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money, without cost. Free grace. Verse 2, why do you spend money for what is not bread? And why your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen, he says, carefully to me. 
and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance incline your ear and come to me listen that you might live friends this is the heart of this beatitude this is why the kingdom citizen is blessed because they're right there they've come they've recognized their poverty of spirit they realize that nothing in themselves and nothing in anybody else can satisfy can fill, can, can bring them what God alone can. And they come humbly, have listened, they have trusted Christ, and they eat and delight in abundance. How about Jesus himself? So much that can be said about this. But the words of Jesus in John chapter 4, for example, uh, in verse 13, Another one of his clear proclamations, this time to a woman that was seeking everything in the world. She was seeking it in husbands and adultery, anything in the world. The woman at the well, John chapter 4, verse 13. Jesus, though, said to her concerning the well water, everyone who drinks of this water, you'll thirst again, right? Obviously. But he goes on and says, But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water. Not a trickle, not a broken cistern. A well of water springing up unto eternal life. This is Jesus. He is the object, friends. Listen to John chapter 6. He says very similar in verse 27. And oh, this is, this is a word perhaps to you today who are seeking everything in the world to satisfy. Jesus himself, 627, Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Verse 35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never hunger, and he who believes on me will never thirst. This is the proclamation. And oh, if you are in Christ today, this is you. You've got it. You have Christ, and you have all his righteousness, and all the conformance that your life can have as you grow in sanctification, battling sin, even as we learn today in Sunday school, killing sin, growing in life and righteousness. This is the life that you have. You see why Jesus says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, because they will be satisfied. What's our next beatitude, though? Again, in, in a similar vein, Blessed, again, that supreme level of life. Blessed are the merciful, the merciful ones, literally. For they shall receive mercy. You might be wondering, how does, what does this have to do with godliness? All these three beatitudes connect to that same spiritual character of a kingdom citizen. Godliness, wanting to be like God. Well, mercy is what we're dealing with in this verse, friends. And how much more can a kingdom citizen be like their master than when their heart is full of mercy? Mercy, what a concept. What a glorious reality. But if I asked you, what does it mean? How would you define mercy? What is mercy? Well, if you look at scripturally how it is used, not only in this verse, but elsewhere, it's really a heart of compassion that flows outward towards others. It's not just the outward, nor is it merely an inward reality. No, it's both. It's the tenderness of soul which sees need and loves to meet that need. It's a kind love. It's a pitying love that looks upon the worthless, the unable, the wretched one, and acts to help them out of that same abundance of kindness and pity and compassion of their very soul. That's what mercy is. You want actually a better definition? 
Most fundamentally, what is mercy? Let me amend the question. Who is mercy? Because that's the answer. God is mercy. That's the definition. He is the standard of mercy. He is the source. He is the fountain of all mercy. It's all found in Him. It all flows out from Him. And out of the infinite abundance of His mercy, He chooses to pour it out upon us. A bunch of wicked, wretched, pitiful sinners. We, then, are the objects of His mercy, of His compassion, of that soul, if you will, of kindness and grace and forgiveness. There's so much in Scripture that screams this from the housetops. God's mercy upon pitiful sinners like you and me. Think of Ephesians chapter 2. That great text that begins with talking about us. A bunch of dead carcasses, right? Dead in our trespasses and sins. And it wasn't like we were just these passive poor victims. No, we were actively living according to the spirit of the age, right? Actively rebelling against him, actively spitting in his face, actively blaspheming him. And yet that very same God, who was sinned against every second of every day, what did he do? But God, verse 4, because, Paul says, of his great mercy, because he was rich in mercy. So much mercy that as, as we're poured out, there was so much an overabundance of mercy. He pours it out upon the most witless, reckless, wicked sinners. And he even goes on to say, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, that shows us as well. It's not just a love that you kind of have in your heart and you're, it just sits there and does nothing. No, it's, it says God had this love and he loved us with it. <laughs> Paul wasn't being redundant. It's the same reality of that mercy that is in the soul and acts to help those in need. And that's the mercy that's been poured out, if you're in Christ, on you and me. We are full of it. It's, it washes us every way. We are Romans 9.23, vessels of mercy. Think of a cup or any kind of vessel. We're full to the brim with His mercy. That's why God's mercy in us is not a dead, stagnant mercy that we kind of got when we were saved and just sticks there and does nothing. No, it is a living mercy. It is a mercy which takes our dead heart full of selfishness and wickedness, mercilessness, takes that heart and exchanges it with a heart, a living heart, a heart like its Savior. A heart like it's God, who is abundant in mercy. And that means the heart of a true kingdom citizen, a true disciple, who's been changed, regenerated, is also full of mercy. That's why Jesus, in verse 7 of our text, calls them merciful ones. Blessed are those merciful ones. That's what God's mercy does. It's not just thrown at us, and does nothing. No, it changes. God's mercy makes us into vessels of mercy. God's mercy makes us into agents of mercy. That's why Jesus in Luke chapter 6 says, Be merciful just like your Father in heaven. Listen to what Dr. MacArthur says concerning mercy biblically. It is a genuine compassion expressed in genuine help. Selfless concern expressed in selfless deeds. It is not simply feeling compassion, but showing compassion. Not only sympathizing, but giving a helping hand. Mercy is giving food to the hungry, comfort to the bereaved, love to the rejected, forgiveness to the offender, companionship to the lonely. And he ends by saying, it is therefore one of the most lovely and noblest of all virtues. And I would add, one of the most godly. Because it's so much like our Savior. Because he's the one who is what? Rich in mercy. And goodness, the amount of applications, ways that this is expressed is more than our time allows. But even just think of in our midst. 
in our relationships with one another, in, in the body of Christ. Do we have need? Let me put it as practically as possible. Just like we were sinners and objects of God's mercy, do we sin against one another? You better believe it. This side of heaven again, we will sin. <laughs> and that includes to one another, us in this room. It's going to happen. What should our response, though, be? As merciful ones, as vessels of mercy, disciples of the kingdom. What does that mean? Then? What's our reaction when someone sins against us? Whether in the church, perhaps in the family, you name it. What happens when someone sins against us? Is it the heart of the king? Mercy? Compassion? To the one who doesn't deserve it? Or is it asserting my way? My goals? What I want to do? Mercy. It sees a need and it seeks to help. It seeks to fill it. It seeks to bring up those who are stumbling and falling, whether sinning or not. It seeks those who are in need, who are unable, and it seeks to fill them with the blessings and mercy and love of God. By the way, this not only applies to one another in the church, but also think about this. In the way that you relate to an unbeliever, whether it's your neighbor or a stranger, whatever the case may be, in evangelism, do you know that evangelism is the most merciful thing you can do to an unbeliever? Think about it again. What is mercy? Heart of compassion. Helping those in need. What is the unbeliever's greatest need? They need their sin to be solved. <laughs> They're on their way to eternal perdition. And they don't even know it. They're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. What's the greatest help you can give them? What's the greatest compassion? What's the greatest mercy you can show them? Telling them the truth concerning their sin and concerning the one rich in mercy, able to forgive their sins right then. Mercy should be, in all, should be all over our lives, brothers and sisters. In fact, in the words of Jesus in our text, mercy is so deeply of the essence of a kingdom citizen that notice what he says at the end, if you're there, Matthew 5, 7. Why are they blessed? Again, because they shall, they will, future tense, receive mercy. Jesus is saying that it is so of the essence of a kingdom disciple to be merciful, that it is those merciful ones that can be assured with an eternal promise that they will receive mercy in the day of judgment. What are we talking about there, though? Are we already saved? Is he, is he saying it's conditional? In other words, if we don't show enough mercy, well, sorry, you won't be shown mercy in the last day. Your salvation is kind of conditional based on your works. Absolutely not. It's just the very same thing that I mentioned a little bit ago concerning bad tree, good tree. How you can know it's your fruits. It is such a part. It is such, it's of the nature of a disciple to be merciful. That if someone in their lifestyle is not merciful, they're showing themselves not to be a disciple. And if you're not a disciple, you've not been saved. You actually haven't received the mercy of God. But what does Jesus say? Since you are my disciple, since I have saved you by my action alone, and I've made you a vessel of mercy who shows those fruits in their life. What a wonderful privilege and blessing it is to know that when you stand before God on that day of judgment, wrapped in the robes of Christ's righteousness, mercy, you won't be accounted for your sins. Why? Because they've been wiped away. You'll receive all the blessings of the kingdom. That's why Jude 21 speaks of when Jesus comes, we're with him. As we wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because that's what he's going to bring. That future and final mercy. When he brings us in and wipes away all the flesh and our struggles with sin. Glorifies us all the rest. That's what Jesus is talking about. They will receive mercy. As one commentator said, those who have experienced God's mercy will show it to others and so demonstrate their destiny as those who will receive mercy on the last day. 
Notice the order. It's not be merciful so that you will receive mercy. No, it's because you've received mercy. Show mercy. And by that you demonstrate your destiny. Are you lacking mercy, perhaps, in your life, dear Christian? Maybe holding grudges. Maybe being unwilling to care. You see needs, whether fellow believer or not. You see needs, spiritual or even otherwise. But your heart is not inclined to care. Are you bitter, perhaps? All of these are manifestations of a lack of mercy. And I would dare say if we want to just get it as simple as possible, as straight and clear as possible, when we don't show mercy, believer, it's because we have pridefully forgotten God's mercies. Simple as that. You're literally breathing in God's mercies every second of every day. Do you realize that every single one of us, if we got what we deserve right now, together, would be in, the, in hell. Every second of every day, mercies. And yet we're stingy. And yet we can't show mercy, that heart of compassion and care, to someone else in a meager way. Nothing compared to what God in Christ has poured out upon you, O vessel of mercy. We're forgetting. We're losing sight. We need to drown ourselves, consider, fix our eyes upon what God has done for us. And that's how we'll show mercy. Because let me tell you, a lack of mercy, that lifestyle, that practice, is not the mark of a disciple of Christ who knows the mercies of God, who loves the mercies of God, who lives in it, and has been changed by God's mercies. Romans 1, that fearful passage that describes the world under God's wrath. At the very end, it gives a list of what those kind of people are, those who will receive God's wrath. You know what one of them is? Kind of tucked away in that list, verse 31. Unmerciful. James chapter 2, verse 13. Judgment will be severe against those who do not show mercy. Again, not in some work salvation sense. No, because it, that character trait, that lifestyle, if that marks your life, that is not someone who has been regenerated, made a disciple. We need to think soberly about this. And oh dear Christian, may God's mercies drive us, fuel us to show mercy as well. Because that, once again, is the blessed state. One more though, we got verse 8. A third mark of a kingdom citizen. Godliness is what we're dealing with in all three of these, right? And again, notice in verse 8 how outward action we've seen in these Beatitudes weaves together with inward heart realities. Jesus' kingdom and the disciples of that kingdom are not marked by just pharisaical, do-good, outside, good manners, no problem, no. It is a deep inward transformation. Look at verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they themselves shall see God. You see, Jesus was, and we'll see this later on in Matthew too, Jesus was completely rebuking the common assumptions of the religion of the day. He's not extolling some outward ritual purity. We read, for example, in Matthew 23, the Pharisees, Sadducees, all those guys. And really, they were just characteristic of most in Israel at the time. But it was all outward. They had the, Jesus says, the outside of the cup, all clean and nice and fancy and polished, but inside full of robbery and self-indulgence. He even speaks of the imagery of a tomb. This nice, whitewashed, painted nice and clean and white People would go to the grave and wouldn't look inside. No, they just want to go see this nice, perfect tomb. It's wonderful to behold. But what's on the inside? Rotting corpses. Jesus is not saying anything like that. Not that purity, quote-unquote. No. What does he say? Pure in heart. 
a heart purity, deepest level purity, heart, soul, the very core of your being, refined, cleaned away, as it were, from all impurities, all any motive, any desire, any goal, any, anything at all that moves away from the righteousness of God. No, this is a heart that is refined unto single-mindedness, undivided devotion, spiritual integrity, and comprehensive holiness. This is purity of heart. Not merely, by the way, if you're wondering, not merely with regard to sexual sin, but in every single way. A purity, a singleness, an undivided devotion to Christ. A pervasive holiness. And once again, we see this all over Scripture. You know the famous psalm, Psalm 51. Perhaps you've even sung it in years past. That central verse, verse 10. Create in me, David asks, a clean heart, a pure heart. Notice, by the way, where he's seeking it from. He can't do it. He knows his sin is too deep, and he says, Lord, create in me a clean heart. And he actually says the same, very same thing in the next line, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Again, it's that single-mindedness, that undivided devotion. That's the idea of purity of heart. What my Lord wants, that's what I want. What He loves, I love. What He hates, I hate. Listen, for example, to Psalm 101. The psalmist there goes into great detail. He says, I will give heed to the blameless way. I will fix my eyes to that. I will walk within my house in the integrity of my heart. Notice, it's not just a public outward, going to church on Sunday, <laughs> holiness. No, it's down to his home life. Integrity of heart. Verse 3, I will set no worthless thing before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not fasten its grip upon me. A perverse heart. Wonderful imagery there, by the way. It's, it's the idea of crookedness. Not straight, not undivided. A perverse heart. No, that shall depart from me. I will know no evil. This is the idea. The resolution of the pure heart before the Lord of a kingdom disciple. I want you guys to turn over to 1 Timothy 1. This is a great text that highlights this. And I love a little nuance that Paul adds there at the near the end of the verse. 1 Timothy 1, verse 5. If you're wondering, by the way, why we do any preaching, teaching, whether during the week, Sundays, doesn't matter. Why? Here's one of the main reasons why. It's not just to fill heads. It's what Paul says to Timothy. 1 Timothy 1.5, the goal of our instruction is love, notice source, from a pure heart. But he also gives other descriptions. A good conscience, if you would, a clean conscience. And a sincere faith. Notice again these terms that all connect to these realities of a purity, of an undivided affection and devotion, a singleness of mind, integrity, no compromise, no outward show with inward deadness. No, a pure heart, clean conscience, sincere faith. Listen to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21. He says, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, the wickedness he speaks of, the dishonor he speaks of previously, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. This is the desire, by the way, of every kingdom citizen. They don't want just personal happiness. No, they want to be useful to the master. They want their joy and their happiness to be in the Lord. And when he says, well done, good my good and faithful slave. No, prepared for every good work. Verse 22, and he says, therefore, flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with all those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Again, could go into so much there. But pure hearts like other pure hearts. We'll put it that way. 
they get more purity. <laughs> they get more clean. They get more single-minded. They, they grow in integrity more and more when they're with others that are on that same quest, on that same sanctifying journey. This is the idea of a pure heart that Jesus describes as blessed. This is the supreme level of life. And just to be clear, once again, Jesus is talking to whom in the Sermon on the Mount? Disciples. If you're thinking you can get a pure heart apart from the saving work of Christ who makes you a disciple, you're deluded, my friend. That's what all other world religions do. Roman Catholic, Mormon, Islam, you name it. That's what everyone in the world is trying to do. No. A pure heart only comes by God's saving work of purification. It's called regeneration. Titus 3 speaks of like the Spirit washing us, taking that dirty, disgusting heart and washing it clean. Ephesians 5 speaks of Christ doing that same work upon the church. It makes us clean. You need, as David did in Psalm 51, you need to go to God for a clean heart. And because he purifies it, just like with mercy, because he purifies it, that, be, that produces fruits of integrity, undivided devotion, and all the rest. But guess what, folks? The equal opposite is true as well. We shouldn't be surprised then that an impure life is produced by an impure heart. One that has never received the saving, purifying work of Christ. Again, lifestyle is what we're dealing with here. Fruits of one's life, consistent fruits. If it is impurity, ungodliness, sinfulness, that's not the heart, that's not the fruit of a true disciple. Listen, if you would, to Titus 1.15. He says, to the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, Nothing is pure. Everything is bent. Everything they think, say, and do is bent toward sinfulness and impurity. He says both their mind and their conscience are defiled. They profess to know God. Notice that, very religious. But by their deeds, fruits, once again, they deny Him. Being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. Can't get more clear than that. Again, Jesus is talking about heart realities, folks. And an impure life is produced by an impure heart. And that's why I would exhort you here today. Doesn't matter if you, you prayed the prayer, you did the deal. Doesn't matter. What's the heart? What's going on there? Are you truly a disciple of Him? Has your heart been washed clean? Because if not, he bids you come, just like He bid the hungry and thirsty to come. He calls you to come. That's where purity is found. That where, that's where cleanliness is found from all your sin and shameful wickedness. Christ alone. Go to Him. Trust in Him. Bow the knee to Him. If you're wondering, by the way, concerning kingdom disciples, how does all this relate to godliness, being like God? Well, there's a couple of ways, by the way. By definition, what is, as we have seen, what is a pure heart? It's a God-filled heart. <laughs> That's what it is. A heart which, again, loves, which, loves the things he loves and hates the things he hates. But also, we need to understand something here. If your heart is pure, if your heart is undefiled, if you will think about a windshield, it's clean, it's clear. If your heart is clean and clear. According to God's Word, it's unobstructed from seeing its greatest object, which is what verse 8 says, does it not? Perhaps if you're wondering why these two things are connected, again in verse 8 of our text, blessed are the pure in heart, for what? They shall see God? What does that have to do with each other? That's how. The pure in heart, the unobstructed heart, the clean heart, as if you will, the nearest and dearest fellowship with God. 
The language of sight, by the way, it's, it's important, perhaps maybe confusing at first if you think about verses that say no man can see God, which is true, in terms of God's his divine essence that's immaterial, no man, not only because of what we are as creatures, but also because of our impurity. No man can see God at any time. And certainly it is true, when we go to heaven, we are going to see God in Christ. Because by the way, if, if you're wondering, Jesus, since his incarnation, is the God-man. He has a glorified body. We're going to see him face to face. We're going to touch, just like Thomas and the disciples did in that upper room, we're going to touch Christ. We're going to see him face to face. But what Jesus in verse 8 is talking about is something a little bit more deep. A little bit more than that. It's what theologians call the beatific vision. What on earth does that mean? Scripture often uses this language of seeing God. Old Testament, for example, seeing God face to face to denote the most intimate fellowship possible with somebody. A nearness that no other nearness can compare to. This is the destiny of the kingdom disciple that Jesus speaks of in Matthew 5.8. To see God in that sense, in the sense, for example, of Psalm 24, those who seek Him, comma, those who seek His face, is what the psalmist there says. It's the same thing. To see God, to see the face of God, denotes that nearness, that fellowship, direct experience of His glories. That's why often in the New Testament, our experience, this side of heaven, is called, if you will, seeing in a mirror dimly. Kind of obscure. We see it dimly, it's there, but not as clearly, as unobstructed as it will be. That's what, we, that's what our destiny is, dear Christian. And guess what? For the kingdom disciple, for the true citizen of the kingdom, the thing that I just described there thrills your heart. Can you imagine this nearness with God? The deepest fellowship with God that makes the nearness you have to Him now, even as a believer, seem like nothing? Not only being with Jesus physically, but that spiritual fellowship, that nearness, experiencing the very presence of the glories of God. It's unbelievable. Again, it thrills the heart of a true kingdom disciple. When we read Revelation 22, for example, which describes all this stuff. The new heavens, the new earth, all the glories there, but oh, much more. <laughs> that we're going to see Him face to face, Revelation 22, 3-5. We're going to know Him. We're going to have that fellowship. We're going to have more experiences of His love, of His mercy, of His grace, of His kindness, of His joy than we'll ever have before, forever and ever. That's what it means to see God. And that's why the blessed, that's why the pure in heart, excuse me, are blessed. Are you blessed, dear Christian? And I would ask again, does that thrill your soul? Does that thrill your soul? That should drive you, by the way, to even more purity of life. You can read in your own time, 2 Corinthians 6, 16 to the first verse of chapter 7. Wonderful text because he points out, Paul does, he gives you a bunch of promises. This is what I'm going to do, the Lord says with my people. They're going to be mine and I'm going to be their father. They will know me. All these glorious Old Testament promises. You know how he ends it by saying, chapter 7 verse 1, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilements of flesh, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Having the promises that I'm going to see God, I'm going to know Him, both in the future and yes, even now, I can know Him more, I can serve Him more, I can love Him more. That kills sin right there. If you having trouble in your own life, killing sin, drink deeply of these promises. These are the blessed people, the kingdom citizens, the ones, as we've seen, who hunger and thirst for righteousness, the core of their being, 
Those who are merciful because they have been so filled with His mercy. And those who are pure in heart. And all founded on the realities, on the promises that they are going to be satisfied, that they will receive mercy, and they're going to see God. I hope your soul, dear Christian, is thrilled with these promises. May your life be blessed as well. Let's talk to the Lord Jesus now in prayer. Wherever your heart's at, if it's full of joy, or perhaps realizing that maybe your practice is not being lined up, maybe you're allowing compromises into your life, ones that do not mark a kingdom citizen, let's ask the Lord now. Let's bring those needs to Him. Lord God of mercy, Lord God of all grace, the Lord who, whom we are created for, whom every soul hunger and thirsts for, and yet, oh, sadly, so many feed on ashes. So many do not know your mercy and therefore are wickedly unmerciful. So many who are filthy of heart. Oh, Lord God, we thank you for pouring out your mercy, your grace, for feeding us, for cleaning us. Oh, God. I pray for every soul here today. May every soul know this blessed state. Lord, for your disciples who are here today, it's theirs, it's purchased, they're in it. May they experience it more and more. May they excel still more. Lord, I pray nothing would be a discouragement to them in this text, but a strong encouragement to excel still more to keep hungering and thirsting for they'll be satisfied, to keep being a vessel of mercy, to continue cleansing themselves. Oh God, founded on those wonderful promises. But I also pray, Lord, for those who are lost, those who don't know you, those who are perhaps self-deceived or whatever the case may be. Oh Lord, that they would see what they don't have. Being blessed means to be Jesus disciple. Oh, Lord, that you would convert them today, that they would know you today, oh, Lord God. And how we thank you for all of this. And we thank you in the name of our King, our Lord Jesus. Amen.